Um, the key takeaway from what Terry just presented is this notion of the W score, uh, which was used for a number of things like fusion and the multi-attribute spaces. Um, that multi-attribute spaces algorithm where you're doing calibration within the SVM, uh, that becomes a very, very powerful idea um, that lets us develop some more interesting decision machines. And so the whole, the whole part of this last uh, section of the, uh, the tutorial is algorithms that minimize the risk of the unknown. So coming back then to the formulation we developed in the first part as well. Um, so let's include the open space risk into our optimization problem. Uh, so remember um, we had this problem of half spaces, uh, right? The raccoon appears way out here in the positive territory of the model uh, we, we trained, uh, linear SVM, say. Um, is there a way we can solve this? We, we kind of danced around this idea of a slab-based model to handle this. If I added this back plane here, uh, besides the original decision boundary uh, defined in the margin area, um, that would solve the problem. I can simply eliminate any uh, uh, features that are appearing way outside of the support of the positive data and, and uh, happily classify them as negatives. Uh, I can't do that in the original instantiation of the decision classifier, but if I have an algorithm that's a bit different, uh, maybe I can do that. Um, so an early algorithm we introduced for this problem is known uh, as the one versus set machine. Um, the idea was to essentially create the slab-based model and perform an optimization that can generalize or specialize uh, based on whatever known uh, positive and negative uh, samples we have at hand. Um, so we can imagine we have our positive class data, maybe some negative class data, um, and we want to just you know, train the normal decision boundary between the two classes we know about. Uh, but then we want to add the second plane. Uh, so we'll call the first plane alpha and the second uh, plane omega. And, and based on data on either side, uh, we can uh, adjust those different uh, decision boundaries. Um, the first thing we want to account for, generalization. Um, if we are trying to classify novel examples of the known positive class, we can't have a really tight fit around the positive training data. We know that's a problem based on our discussion of the one class SVM from earlier. Um, so what can we do? Um, what's nice here, if you have some uh, labeled training data, but you're still training a binary classifier, but you know that um, there's, say, three classes in this case, um, maybe you have this situation where um, you get good separation between your positive class and the negative class number two, um, but you can still generalize a little bit because there's space in that margin region, and I want to push that as far as I can to make sure I capture novel uh, positive examples that might fall over here. Same thing goes uh, for the back plane. If I can keep pushing back a little bit further, uh, maybe I can account for feature vectors that will appear in this space as well. But I don't want to push it too far because then I'll end up in this open space uh, which we're trying to reduce, uh, and, and I end up here in the, the space of another class three. Um, specialization, we're going the other way. Uh, maybe we want to refine our decision boundary so we push in farther because there's some ambiguity uh, where we are. Uh, here's the original decision boundary. Uh, maybe we're getting some false classifications. Uh, same thing on the back plane, so I'm going to push back in based on my known training data. Um, we need a, a risk formulation for the algorithm itself. Uh, so if we think about open space risk for a linear slab model, uh, we want to define uh, delta sub A here, which is a marginal distance of the near plane, uh, which is accounting for overgeneralization risk. So look at the distance between the back plane and the front plane. Uh, and then uh, we also account for the separation needed to account for all of the positive data. That's this delta plus. So divide those. Uh, or we want to account for over-specialization risk. So just flip the the, the division here and put the separation needed to account for all positive data on top as our numerator and then that distance as the denominator. Um, that's not everything though. Uh, in this algorithm we've included two additional terms. Uh, the first is the importance of open space around A multiplied by the margin around A, so that's uh, accounting for the front plane. And then the same thing for the back plane as well. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about parameters involved to adjust uh, those particular terms. Um, so to recap, remember in, in the first part of this talk we had um, some, some variables we needed to define. Um, that is the same case here. Just to recap, space of positive class data we'll call P, space of other known class data K, positive training data is this set drawn from P, V hat, negative training data 
uh, k hat drawn from all of those known negatives, unknown negatives appearing in testing. Uh, because it's open set, we have these now again. Uh, we'll denote that as u. And then the testing data is just the union of all of those sets. So we get our known positives, our known negatives, and some sampling of, of unknowns, quote unquote. Um, so a sketch of the algorithm itself, um, it starts off just by training a linear SVM uh, using our known training data, positives and negatives. Uh, nothing special there. Uh, you can tune the parameters as you wish. Um, but then we're going to generate decision scores for each training point in the positive and negative training sets. Um, and this is important because this will let us do um, uh, some estimation here. We're going to sort those scores um, where S sub K is the minimum and S sub J is the maximum. Then we're going to initialize A to the margin plane of the original model from SVM F. And then we're going to initialize the omega, the back plane, uh, to S sub J, which was the maximum in our sorted list. And then we'll just, in a greedy fashion, iteratively move these planes back and forth. Uh, to minimize our risk uh, from the original formulation, which was the open space risk, plus any regularization constant we have uh, on the empirical risk term. Um, however, um, we can do some further regularization uh, and refine the planes based on uh, those points that are far out on the positive, uh, or sorry, the, the near planes positive boundary and then the far planes positive boundary. And so we call this uh, adjusting pressure. So we can have positive pressure and negative pressure. And uh, based on those last points, we can move in or out. So it's a further way to generalize or specialize given the data situation at hand. Um, the prediction function is really, really trivial, uh, as it turns out. Um, we take our score from the trained SVM, and we simply check the bounds. Uh, does it fall uh, between the near plane, and does it fall right the, between the far plane, or between those two? Um, if so, the answer is just one. Otherwise, it's negative one. Uh, so what we've done in a post hoc fashion here is estimate the slab, and then we use the SVM model and just check the scores against the slab region. If we fall within that region, we're good. If we're outside, uh, we, we reject. Um, this, this works, and we'll show you some, some results uh, in terms of uh, its performance. Um, but of course, it could be better. Um, it doesn't inherently support multi-class open set recognition, which was our reach goal when we started to talk about open set recognition in general. Um, it doesn't support nonlinear kernels. It's just a linear model. Um, it does not contain a cat model. That's a key theoretical uh, uh, shortcoming of the one versus set machine. Uh, and um, it lacks calibrated probability scores, which Terry was just telling you how great they are. Um, so there was no EVT in this particular model. Uh, the only thing we're doing to reduce uh, open space risk here is adding the back plane and creating the slab. Um, it does better than a linear model, uh, but what I'm going to talk about next is much, much better. Um, so thinking about uh, the work we did with the, the attribute calibration, um, that really wasn't inherently open set uh, because we had a closed set of attributes and a, uh, an established data set. Um, but we really liked the calibration that was baked right into the SVM formulation. Uh, so trying to extend that to open set, we introduced uh, this new formulation, which we call the PI SVM, uh, which models uh, probability of class inclusion, which is where we get P sub I uh, in the name. Uh, in a nutshell, we're fitting a robust single class probability model over the positive class scores from a discriminative binary classifier. Um, a binary RBF classifier helps discriminate the positive class from the no negative class. And a single class probability model adjusts decisions uh, to avoid misclassification of unknowns. Um, so if we consider a kernelized SVM to begin with, um, we have this familiar formulation. If you've ever done supervised machine learning, you probably recognize this. Um, we have these alpha sub i support vectors. Uh, we have, uh, in this case, an RBF kernel because we're moving beyond a linear model and some bias term. Uh, so what we're doing when it comes to probability calibration here, uh, we're going to take scores from the positive training data on the positive decision boundary side of things, and we will fit then uh, to the tail of that distribution a viable uh, the, why would we choose the viable? Because the scores are bounded from below because we're taking everything from zero onwards. Uh, because again, it's an SVM. It gives positive scores for positive classification uh, starting at zero uh, if you're not using some kind of exotic calibration already. Um, and uh, we'll end up with our model uh, expressing that viable distribution. In this case, it's a three-parameter model, uh, scale, shape, and uh, position. 
Um, and, and ideally, this will give us then the probability of inclusion. Uh, so we can couple that uh, with the original decision to make our final determination uh, because we now have a probabilistic calibration of the model. Um, so you can think of this in, in a Bayesian context. Um, we may have some prior probability of a known class. Uh, we may then have some constant applied to this as well. And then we multiply all of that by the viable CDF defined by those parameters uh, from our fitting. So we train the model. We fit the probability model on top of that. And then we use this formulation to get a probability, which we can then threshold to make our decision. Um, one thing to note here, uh, we're using unnormalized posterior estimates uh, because if all classes and priors are known, then Bayes' theorem yields this, this nice little equation here and we can calculate uh, the term for the posterior. Um, but that's not true uh, for open set recognition because we don't know all the classes and priors because of the unknowns. Um, so for this formulation, we just set this to one uh, and treat the whole estimate as unnormalized. Um, so for multi-class uh, uh, open set recognition, what does the decision function look like? Uh, we basically go through all of the probabilities we cal uh, calculated for all of the classes we know, and then we check those probabilities against some threshold and we take the best score. Uh, and so we, of course, have to estimate this threshold based on the known data at hand. Um, Terry mentioned a, a, big, a big open question in EVT modeling in general is, uh, what is the tail size? You're, you're always fitting to extrema, but I didn't tell you how to identify those extrema or what to do. Um, in, in many cases, uh, when you're doing EVT modeling, you just guess. You say, all right, uh, I know the tail um, is you know, less than 50% of the data I have at hand on either side. Um, I'll, I'll just fit on that. Um, and then you may uh, have a validation set and you just tune it like a hyperparameter. Um, uh, one question that, that we've been posing is, you know, what's a better automatic way to do that? Um, again, EVT tells us how to model extrema, but it says nothing about how many samples to model. Um, but it turns out that a difference between a tail size of 5% and a tail size of 20% can produce a difference in recognition accuracy of 15 to 20%. That's huge. Uh, so if you're messing up the tail estimation, uh, you could have a degenerate model off the bat. Um, what we've been thinking about is treating support vectors as extrema. Uh, support vectors are a type of extreme sampling that effectively describes the class boundary. Um, there's a question here, is there a known parametric relationship between training data size, dimensionality, and the number of support vectors? It turns out no, uh, and Vapnik demonstrated this ages ago. Uh, so an alternative is to consider extrema to be the points close to the original decision boundary and simply count them. Uh, and so uh, in, in recent work, we introduced this little scheme. Um, if we consider an indicator function, we consider uh, a recognition score. Uh, when that recognition score is greater than zero, some points inside the positive boundary are included. We check that against the threshold. Uh, we look at the positive tail size then. Um, better way to do it in terms of practical implementation, tail size approximation. Uh, we found that by taking the max of either three or this constant psi, which is uh, 1.25 to 2.5 times the number of positive support vectors, uh, yields a nice tail size. Um, why three? What's that magic constant? Um, it turns out uh, you need uh, some amount of, of samples to actually do the fitting. If you go too small, uh, you can't do a statistical fitting. Uh, most libraries that we've looked at, uh, three is kind of where it, it caps out. Um, though I think we've gotten good fits with two points, right? So <laughs> you can't put the shit. Yeah, you can't put the shit. It's not, it's not ideal. So three, three is probably the, the, the smallest number you want. Uh, of course, you may be looking at some degenerate models where you don't have many support vectors, so sometimes this may apply. Um, but, but this is kind of our, our, our effort right now to do this. Um, tail size estimation, um, fraction of data that is a support vector, um, that's a big question. Um, uh, here we're showing um, that um, you can't consistently pick this uh, a priori because depending on your problem, uh, that sampling can be much different. Uh, and so this is a big, this is a big question. Um, so Terry showed you earlier um, some plots. Um, you know what was problematic about various alternatives uh, for um, making decisions in supervised machine learning. Uh, remember we had these unknowns floating out in space. Um, you know we had a binary problem in some of those plots, and we had really wonky looking uh, 3D plots depending on uh, the data space, the future space, uh, and and the nature of the problem itself. Uh, when we're normalizing decision scores for the Pi SVM, uh, notice uh, this is a, a decent situation compared to what we had before. Um, 
we're eliminating the unknowns because they're very far away from the positive support, uh, and we're not pushing down into the score space to include uh, uh, these, these known negatives, the second class. Uh, and so this, this turns out to be a much better model in practice. Um, implementation, um, where, where would you find this algorithm? I just told you about it now. Um, we have uh, a patch to libSVM, which implements this. It implements the one versus set machine I just talked about, and also the WSVM, which I'm going to talk about next. Uh, and it's just another option. You can just choose it as the decision machine you want to train uh, and go off and use it. Uh, you don't have to do anything special in terms of preparing the features. Uh, just use a libSVM formatted feature file, and you can try this out of the box. Uh, of course, um, there's some parameter tuning, of course. Uh, and if you want, uh, there's a link on our, uh, our, our companion website to this tutorial where you can download it right now and, and check it out. Uh, we're going to save. I'm gonna, we're going to talk about all the results. Terry's going to talk about the results for all these algorithms I'm talking about uh, in the next section of this this part of the tutorial. Uh, but I'm going to move forward uh, with the next algorithm. So, is the Pi SVM what we're looking for for open set recognition? Um, pros: It supports multi-class open set recognition because we can iterate over all the probabilities for all the known classes and apply the threshold. Um, and it gets better generalization, generalization uh, than the one versus set machine. Um, the EVT calibration helps a lot. This is a much better learning formulation. Um, the cons that we found, it's a one-sided calibration model. All we did was model the probability of inclusion. We forgot about you know, the negative side, which could be significant. Um, and it doesn't make use of a cap model, which we told you is very important in the first part of this tutorial. Um, so coming back to the cap model, what can we do with that? Um, there's a very, very simple, almost trivial algorithm you can uh, uh, derive uh, for using a cap model, and that's just nearest neighbor plus cap. Uh, so let d sub x be the distance to the nearest neighbor of x, uh, and then let d sub x greater than some threshold tau uh, yield a probability of zero, meaning you, you are too far away. Uh, remember, we're trying to limit our, our open set risk in this case. Um, and then we can get uh, a value other than zero as a probability if we take this threshold tau, uh, subtract that point to figure out what the distance is, and then uh, divide it by tau itself. So in a multi-class setting, this results in a thresholded nearest neighbor algorithm that can reject an input as unknown. That's useful because nearest neighbor isn't doing that inherently out of the box. Um, so what's good about this algorithm? With a sufficiently dense sampling, uh, nearest neighbor plus cap reduces to nearest neighbor. Uh, limiting the error at no more than twice the Bayes error rate, that just is carried over from nearest neighbor inherently. And it's very simple to train, because we know nearest neighbor is a pretty simple algorithm. Uh, the bad news is here, it's a weak probability model. We didn't invoke any of our cool EVT stuff. Um, it's just a trivial computation based on the distances uh, from the threshold. Um, so, so the best algorithm we have right now uh, for decision making is, is this one, uh, the WSVM, or Bible Calibrated SVM. This is the one out of, out of the toolkit that I use uh, most often. Um, binary SVMs are better than one class SVMs, um, but how do they fit into the context of cat models? Um, Unfortunately, the decision score isn't a canonical sum. The calibration is still possible. Um, you can collect all positive coefficients into one sum, collect all negative coefficients into another, split the bias between them, and then view the SVM as a decision rule over which is more similar. Um, so the idea here with a binary RBF SVM incorporating uh, a CAT model, uh, combine probabilities computed for both a one class and a binary RBF SVM. Uh, remember we mentioned the one class model uh, for one class SVM is quite weak. So maybe if we couple it with a more powerful binary model where we had some no negative data, we can do much better. Um, and that's what we do here. Uh, so we use the one class SVM cat model as a conditioner. So compute the probability using the one class model for class association. See if it exceeds some threshold. If yes, uh, then consider this. Otherwise, just reject. Uh, so we would move on then to a binary classification. If this gave us some even very remote indication uh, that um, we have class association. So you can set this threshold uh, delta sub tau to be very, very low probability. If we just want some inkling that we're in the right ballpark for class association with the positive data. Because we'll let the, the calibrated binary model do the, the heavy lifting here. Uh, but this will eliminate an enormous amount of, of troubling unknowns uh, because right, the, the space is so large and we're only interested in a small piece of it for our positive data. Um, so here we're using a dual tail fitting. Uh, we're solving that problem that the Pi SVM had. It was just doing uh, probability of class inclusion. Uh, so separating positive and negative data is useful. 
assume a set of known classes y. For a class uh, small y and y, we can use the positive scores from y to estimate uh, a probability of positive uh, class association. And then we can use negative scores from other known classes to also estimate class association. And this becomes uh, this dual tail fitting. So remember, this is just the pi SVM probability of inclusion. Uh, and then we're doing a reverse Bible fit to the non-match data. Uh, what does that mean conceptually? Any guesses? We are, we, it's a positive class that we're trying to deal with. Uh, we want to understand positive class association. So if we're fitting a reverse viable here uh, to the non-match data, what is that giving us an indication of? Any guesses? Uh, it turns out to be an indication of not being in the non-match class. So it's another way to kind of think about being in the positive class. Um, and again, it's a decision boundary uh, problem. We're taking extrema uh, here at the decision boundary, just on the other side, uh, like we did for pro uh, class inclusion. Um, so closed set scenario, um, everything would just be 1 minus uh, uh, the, the probability of the negatives. But in an open set scenario, we can't make the above assumption because we don't have an exhaustive sampling of all the negatives. Uh, so to minimize open set risk, uh, the probability of the positives and negatives are considered only when the CAT model uh, gives us an, a good indication of class association. So we never move on to the binary model until we have uh, that, that possibility. Uh, EVT parameters, um, again, we've talked about this, uh, three parameters for both the reverse Bible and the Bible. Um, we usually use maximum likelihood estimation to estimate the best fits uh, for these particular parameters. Um, here, uh, we're using some notation. Uh, so eta here um, is, is for um, the, uh, the negatives, I believe, is that right? And then the positives are fit with, with psi here. Um, so we get two independent estimates uh, for probability of, of the class label given our, our decision uh, score coming out of the train model. Um, the viable CDF from the match data and the reverse viable CDF from the non-match data. I oh, know I did flip these. Sorry, this is, this is the positive and this is the negative. Um, we, to combine these estimates, what do you do? Um, you have two options that are fairly obvious, uh, addition and multiplication. Um, multiplication, the probability that the input is from the positive class and not from any of the known negative classes. And the addition version of this would be uh, either a positive or a not uh, known negative. Um, so for open set recognition, a uh, piece of psi should be modulated by other supporting evidence of the sample being positive. Uh, so we recommend the product as the preferred combination here. Um, Multi-class WSVM recognition, um, what are we doing? Um, first, we apply the one-class SVM, which has been probabilistically calibrated uh, using the EVT fitting. Uh, and we have an indicator function. If we beat uh, our, our threshold here, uh, then we just signal move on to the binary classification stage. When we move here, uh, then we have to consider those two additional tail uh, models uh, for the binary classifier itself. And that gives us our probabilistic indication. Multiply that by the indicator. So if this ended up being zero, of course, we wouldn't care about any of this. But if it's one, we had some inkling that it was uh, perhaps the positive training data, or part of positive class data that we knew about. Um, then, then we would move on and get the actual probability out of this. And then uh, from that particular score, we would apply a second level threshold, uh, which would give us our final answer. This is uh, you know, a known class, or it, it's still rejected as either a negative or an unknown. Um, so these, of course, are free parameters. You can only estimate them based on known examples because you don't have the unknowns. Uh, so that's one tricky part. Um, training a WSVM step-by-step. -step. I'm going to walk through this just briefly, uh, because that's a lot of, of math I kind of just threw up on the screen. And so it'd be nice to, to see this in a more uh, graphical uh, uh, form. For simplicity, let's focus on a single class. We'll just save the handwritten digit 3. And we'll have two SVM models, our one class and our binary, and three EVT distribution fits. We need one for the one class cap model, and then we need two for the binary model. And a collection of SVM models, EVT distribution parameters, and thresholds constitute the whole package that is the WSVM. So it's not just one thing. Um, so pretty basic, we start uh, just fit an RBF, uh, one class SVM, which yields our CAT model around the positive training data. Then we're going to fit our viable distribution over the tail scores from that data. So this would be the probability of inclusion just for the one class model. 
and we'll store those parameters, and then we'll also choose some threshold. Uh, I think our default in the software is 0.001, so very, very tiny probability, but again, we just want some indication that we need to move on to the next step. Uh, train a binary SVM, same deal, we'll choose an RBF, take that same training data, but now move in our known negatives, uh, and here we have class one, uh, 0, 1, and 2. Um, we'll do our EVT fits again, getting uh, two more sets of parameters defining the two distributions. Uh, and then we'll choose our, our delta sub r, which is our threshold for the binary uh, uh, probability scores coming out of this. Here we're choosing 0 0.5 times openness. Remember we talked about openness in the first part? Um, if we have an evaluation set, we can kind of make inferences about that, what the openness of our problem is. Given our known training data at hand, we can simulate unknown data to figure this out. Uh, and then empirically, we've determined 0.5 times openness gives us a reasonable uh, probability threshold. Uh, but again, depending on your problem, you may want to re-estimate that. Um, so, so that's it for training. So we have a whole set of parameters, and we have two trained SVM models, one one class, one binary. So for testing from a known class, let's focus on the class we just trained for, three. Um, six steps are necessary to test the input, and we'll assume four known classes. So we'll have models for 0, 1, 2, and 3. Um, input comes in, it's a novel instance of the hand uh, written digit 3, we'll say, uh, and we're going to apply all, all four uh, uh, one class SVM models and get scores out of them. Uh, so here we have models for 0, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, we're going to normalize then all those one class SVM scores using our EVT model, so now we have probabilities for each of the, the four classes. Uh, and that's just done by applying the CDF for, for those parameters, which we estimated. And Given those probability scores, we can then just test them. Uh, so we'll go through and see if we pass uh, through anything. So um, these were lousy. Uh, uh, we have models uh, for, for 0 and 1. Uh, 2 and 3 got past the initial probability test, so we'll move on to the binary classifiers for them. Uh, so we get two more scores from those binary models. Uh, we'll again look at our, our EVT uh, fits, but in this case we're doing uh, 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 the CDF calculation for two models, we get out two probabilities uh, for each uh, class, and then we combine those probabilities with the indicator variables, uh, and in this case we finally got a, a good probabilistic estimate uh, coming out of our, our model for class 3, the full WSVM, uh, and, and these were rejected right away with the CAP model. The third one passed with the indicator variable, uh, but the probabilities we got out of the binary model were so low that uh, this one is rejected as well. It didn't beat our threshold, and we get our final determination. Um, so what happened, again, thinking about CAP models, um, we had uh, this 3, it appeared in the CAP thresholded region, and it also appeared in the WSVM thresholded region, uh, which we're showing here is broader than just what the CAP gives you. Um, and and so, so that's great. Uh, we didn't have the, the risk of the unknown affecting this particular decision, but of course it was something we knew about. Uh, so now we can ask what happens when we have an unknown class. So we can again assume the same for known classes. We can consider as input a member of a class that is different from the training data. In this case, we'll say somebody wrote the letter Q, which is not in our, our known uh, world of, of points. Uh, and this will certainly fall outside of a cap thresholded region. It, you know, it exists in open space. And so we just need four steps here to reject the input. It comes in, uh, we check the cap models, um, so we get a score for each of the, the one class models. We again go to our EVT models to get probabilities for each instance. Uh, we check them against uh, all of the, 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 the um, thresholds we have set for these particular models. And in all these cases, they fail. Uh, the cap model was able to reject this because it was very far away from the feature space of all of these trained models. And so um, we basically just indicate uh, to the binary models that we failed. We don't even have to compute that data, um, and we reject at that point. Um, so we can kind of short circuit the, the computation, which is nice in some cases. Um, what happened visually here, remember our, our 3 was over here in the, the WSVM threshold region and also the CAP thresholded region. Um, the, this is way out of both of them. So, um, you know, we didn't make it into the CAP thresholded region. We didn't make it into the more narrow WSVM thresholded region. And so we were able to reject that input because it lived in open space. Um, WSVM, I mentioned this patch to libSVM we have, this is in there. And again, this is the one I really recommend uh, that you use if you want to play around with some of these algorithms. Um, the PySVM can be good too in some circumstances, and it's much lighter weight if space is a concern. If you have very high dimensional representations, 
Um, your models could be giant in this case because the WSVM is retaining support vectors for one class and for uh, the binary model, um, and that could be big. Uh, so PySVM could have some, some advantage there. 